I would like to uh, like to say welcome everybody to this webinar on North Korea is not our enemy. Uh, I'm so pleased to be joined by Echo, Women Across the EMZ's Director and Coordinator of Activism and Special Campaigns and a wonderful activist and uh, just such a great leader. Thanks for joining us today, Echo. Um, you know, recently North Korea just, you know, announced its intentions that it's no longer seeking reunification with South Korea. Just six years ago, you know, Presidents Kim Jong-un and Moon Jae-in were meeting. They were talking about an end of war declaration in late 2021. President Moon Jae-in of South Korea, you know, said that there was a in principle agreement to end the Korean War and that was supported ostensibly by the United States, by China, by both Korean governments. Six years on, uh, it seems like after President uh, Yoon's election in South Korea, after President Biden has sent nuclear uh, submarines to the Korean Peninsula in the first time in almost 40 years, we're almost right back where we were before the uh, peace process picked up again in 2018. It seems that North Korea feels even more threatened than before. Is there still hope for reunification, Echo? And why has the peace process fallen so far? Thank you, Kale. And thank you, Code Pink, for inviting me. Um, I'm Echo, joining from Fairfax, Virginia, near Washington, DC. Um, I'm a member of Korea Peace Now Grassroots Network and also Women Across DMC staff. Um, thank you so much, Code Pink, for making this important webinar at the very timely um, session. Um, yes, so what happened since 2018, 2019 talks? Uh, when almost uh, Moon Jae-in almost declared end of war with DPRK. And now DPRK is back to testing their missiles. They're changing their policy to clearly show that they're now changing their posture from defensive to offensive. So what has happened recently under Biden and under current South Korean President Yoon that have brought this situation? Um, so I think... Today's audience, Code Pink people and KPNG people, I don't think you need Korean War 101. So we're not going to go back to 1950 to begin where the Korean War started. But um, I will bring you back to 33 years ago, uh, to 1991. Um, so Chaos Question, has uh, North Korea truly abandoned unification? Um, so this is a picture from the 8th Workers' Party Congress, 9th in large plenum in December. Um, so 33 years ago in 1991, um, there was an important uh, agreement and uh, uh, that came, uh, that kind of planted the seed uh, for current stage and for unification. So recent announcement from General Secretary Kim Jong-un clearly show that DPRK policies have changed. And since the Korean War armistice, which was 1953, July 27, there has been several, talk, several talks um, and several efforts for reunification of Korea. So there was July 4th, 1972, the joint communique and this one, 1991, the Agreement on Reconciliation, Non-Aggression, and Exchanges and Cooperation. So between the South and North Korea, uh, right before this agreement, North and South Korea both joined UN in September 1991 at the same time as two countries. Um, and this agreement um, that was signed on December 13, 1991, um, after they both joined the UN, uh, recognized uh, that their relationship not being a relationship between two countries, but it this their stage is a special interim relationship stemming from the process towards reunification. So some important lines on this agreement is that South and North Korea shall recognize and respect each other's system. And the two sides shall not interfere in each other's internal affairs. And that two sides shall not slander or vilify each other. 
So they agree to recognize and respect each other as a socialist country in the northern and a capitalist country in the southern, and also that two, re two states will move towards reunification. And, and an a, a important agreement um, after that is uh, br would bring bring us to 2000, June 15, when the North and South leaders um, had a two, 2000, June 15 uh, joint declaration. Oh, and going back to 1991, around that time, that's when Soviet Uni Union was coming to an end and the Cold War was coming to an end around that time. And South Korea was reaching out to other socialist countries, expanding its diplomacy. And they called this the Northern policy. And um, this was when South Korea made diplomatic ties with Russia, China, and other European countries. So why not make amicable relationships with uh, North Korea, uh, who are our people? We still call each other our people, same people, right? And then the huge breakthrough in June 15, 2000, when South Korean president, then president Kim Dae-jung and North Korean leader Kim Jong-il met and adopted June 15 North-South Joint Declaration. So the important point from this declaration is that the South and North have agreed to resolve the question of reunification independently and through the joint efforts of the Korean people who are the masters of the country. And for the achievement of reunification, they have agreed that there's a common element in the South concept of confederation and the North's formula for a loose form of federation. The South and North uh, have agreed to promote reunification in that direction. Um, And um, I, after 2000, there was also 2007, October 2007. Uh, you mentioned, Kale, that Moon Jae-in almost came um, to an end of war declaration towards uh, the end of his term. Um, and 2018 was not the first time the end of declaration was declared. Actually, um, October 2007, when North, Northern uh, leader then Kim Jong-il and South Korean leader uh, Roh Moo-yeon held inter-Korea summit and agreed on October 4th declaration after South and North summit. And the two leaders declare that South and North both recognize the need to end the current armistice regime and build a permanent peace regime. So this is just a screenshot. I don't think you have to read everything on this October 2007. But once again, uh, they agreed to firmly transform inter-Korean relations into ties of mutual respect and trust, transcending the differences in ideology and systems. So the South and North Korea both have agreed to opposing war on the Korean Peninsula and to adhere strictly to their obligation to non-aggression. And that they recognize the need to end current armistice, armistice regime and build a permanent peace regime. So unfortunately, um, after 2007, Uh, conservative president of South Korea, Lee Myung-bak, came into place. Um, so he was calling for denuclearization before peace. So October 4th agreement uh, was never properly implemented after Lee Myung-bak came in place. And then president United, of the United States was Barack Obama. And we know that his administration dealt with North Korea with strategic patience, which was not helpful at all on any peace front. So in the recent few years, um, once again, conservative South Korean President Yoon Song yeol and Joe Biden, a person from Obama administration with inaction on diplomatic exchanges with North Korea, his stance towards DPRK is very similarly close to Obama's strategic patience. And now here we are. Um, with our current situation. 
So from 1991 to 2000 and until recently, um, there was an emphasis on Korea as one people, one nation, but two states. Now, with uh, Kim Jong-un's, uh, with the recent 10th session of the 14th Supreme People's Assembly of DPRK, Kim Jong-un called the country's constitution to be changed and that South Korea be defined as the most hostile state. So North Korea has abolished um, the agencies that overthrew cooperation and unification with the South and uh, internal international organizations, uh, which is comparable to civil or civil society organizations, because North Korea um, civil society group is also belongs to Workers Party, the organization dealing with uh, South Korea civil society are also part of Workers Party. So to name a couple, June 15 North Korean Committee and Cho um, Pyeong uh, the Committee for Peaceful Reunification of Korea, they have recently been shut down. Um, and we uh, went over how June 15 declaration was very important and significant to Korean reunification. And the, uh, the only joint organization that has the same name in North Korea, South Korea, and, and international is the June 15 committee. So after North Korea's June 15 committee was shut down, um, you might have read in the news that reunification power has been demolished. Um, so DPRK is showing physically um, on their hard line on this issue. So, uh, it's a big shift in the policy that uh, in about in about 30 years that North Korea is now taking. And now North Korea does not consider South Korea as their fellow countrymen. But how about South Korea? Um, South Korea until now, since 1945, still have the national security law, uh, which names communism illegal. It recognizes North Korea as political entity is illegal. And if you support North Korea regime, you can be imprisoned if you're a South Korean citizen under this law for being anti-South Korean government. And this law really infringes on people's freedom of speech. So during President Moon around 2004 and 2005, his administration tried to abolish it, but with the Conservative Party opposing it, he failed. During Moon Jae-in administration, we know that um, he's very progressive, but he, he also failed. So in a way, DPRK, uh, their stance right now is giving up their one-sided love for South Korea and maybe no longer begging for South Korea to reciprocate uh, North Korea's yearning for reunification. And with the conservative South Korean UN administration in place currently, there really has, has not even been a lukewarm friendship between North Korea and South Korea. Um, so you can draw uh, why DPRK is now speaking on hardline rhetoric that they will name South Korea as a principal enemy and ending its policy on reunification. Yeah, it's a very harrowing situation. I, I really appreciate you putting, uh, you know, the recent statement in context with all the escalations that have been happening from really, uh, you know, the, you know, the United States, especially in South Korea as well. I wanted to, you know, quote uh, part of the statement because um, uh, when it was addressed to the Supreme People's Assembly, Chairman Kim also kind of referenced the situation in the Middle East. He said that, um, uh, you know, he was talking specifically about how, you know, the what the U.S. right now is doing in Israel, sorry, what the U.S. and Israel are doing in, in the Middle East, um, you know, should be part of the discussion um, when it comes to actually uh, uh, understanding the world system um, and understanding the threats that are coming. He's specifically said, explicitly speaking, we will never unilaterally unleash a war if the enemies do not provoke us. Should the U.S. like take the statement seriously? And how should the peace movement in the United States understand North Korea's security concerns? Yes, definitely. Um... Uh, U.S. should take this statement seriously, um, and uh, I don't think I saw anything uh, lately uh, coming out of the U.S. government yet, but uh, 
the last few years, uh, last year, you remember U.S. Uh, hosting um, Yoon Song Yeol for a state visit. And Biden committed to giving Seoul a control over, for the first time, in strategic planning for the use of nuclear weapons in any conflict with North Korea. Uh, Biden also announced that United States would send American nuclear ballistic missile submarine to dock in South Korea for the first time in decades. So what can we what can we say about US's stance uh and you what how US has been dealing with North Korea um on this issue and uh more about South Korea what Yoon has been uh doing um in June 2023 Yoon appointed neo conservative person Kim Young Ho as their unification minister and he was uh, he was well known as often criticizing North Korean human rights. He was outspoken on destruction of North Korea regime and overthrowing Kim Jong-un regime. And in September 2023, the Const uh, Constitution Court struck down the 2020 law that criminalized the sending the anti-Pyongyang propaganda leaflets to North Korea. So I'll come back to the balloon issue a little bit later. Um, in November 2023, South Korea partially suspended the Comprehensive Military Agreement (CMA), the agreement that made between that was made between President Moon Jae-in and Kim Jong Un on September 19, 2018. So after South Korea partially suspended it, North Korea decided to let go of it, um, following South Korea's move. Uh, South Korea still internally has um, reunification by absorption, reunification under liberate, liberal democracy as their state policy. So um, this series of U.S. and South Korean policies have exaggerated the downfall of diplomacy. And I don't think it's an exaggeration that um, they see uh, exaggeration that uh, to say that these acts brought North Korea's hostile policies. Mm. I mean, specifically uh, in that address he gave to the um, Supreme People's Assembly, Chairman Kim said, if the ROK, uh, that's the Republic of Korea, uh, you know, South Korea violates even 0 0.001 millimeters of our territorial land, air and waters, it will be considered a war provocation. Like, what are the chances of the Korean War becoming a hot war, especially now where, you know, I can't imagine there's any inter-Korean communication at the moment. Right. Uh, the inter-Korean communication has died down. Even the hotlines um, has died for a few months now. So the speech about 0 0.001 millimeter of territorial violation, we're pay everybody's paying attention to this clause. But apparently Kim Jong-un used this in February 2018 when DPRK was holding their 70th year anniversary of the founding of the military. Um, at the military parade, he made, he made a speech saying that we must not allow invaders to violate or harass even 0 0.001 millimeter of the dignity and sovereignty of our sacred homeland. So that's what Kim Jong-un said. So he's kind of repeating this, but I guess the tension, the rise, rise of tension right now is bringing this, um, people are kind of feeling it a little more uh, when he mentioned that recently. Um, and to answer the chances of Korean War becoming a hot war, there's always a chance of the 70 year Cold War becoming a hot war. Why? because there's been a US ROK joint war drill since 1950, taking place in South Korea twice a year, at least. And now with the uh, North Korea naming South Korea as a principal enemy, uh, with the slight accident during any kind, any of these military drills, the Cold War can turn into a hot war. And there has not been any inter-Korean summit since um, I guess June June 2019 between U.S., South Korea, and North Korea joint summits, and no meaningful inter-Korean communication since President Yoon came into an, into the office, and North and South Korea hotline has been shut down since April 2023. 
So with nothing more than continued joint U.S.-South Korea war drills that have resumed uh, since 2021, actually there was a stop, uh, the war drill stopped in 2018 when the North Korea, South Korea, and U.S.-North Korea summits were taking place, and they resumed in 2021. Um, and there has been no peace talks. So it's been obvious that DPRK and South Korea people are ever more threatened on an accidental breakout of uh, another Korean war, a hot Korean war. Um, so I wanted to mention a little bit of the history of the US-South uh, Korea joint war drills because this is something we've had webinars in the past and we take it very, very seriously. So um, US ROK war drills 101 today. <laughs> Um, U.S. and South Korea, they have routinely conducted large-scale joint military exercises that prepare for war with North Korea since 1955. The size and scale of these annual military exercises have grown steadily, such that by 1976, they mobilized more than 100,000 troops every spring and fall. So 100,000 Troop, U.S. troops from uh, other countries will come to Korea for the joint war drills. Um, and these war drills, uh, they're based on operation plans that reportedly include preemptive strikes and decapitation measures against North Korean leader. And even during the last year's war drill, uh, taken out of Supreme Leader was an option according to South Korean defense minister Shin Won-shik. Um, he told reporters during an interview, according to, um, and this is according to uh, NK News, um, which was very rare admission in the recent years from Seoul leader about an operation that hasn't been publicly discussed for the last six years. So this was just last year, last month, uh, December, 2023. And in the past, Pyongyang has vigorously objected that these war drills stating that they were offensive and aggressive act and a continued threat to their security. The US and South Korea have scaled back the exercises temporarily suspended large scale field exercises after US DPRK summit in 2018, um, but they have uh, held a major 10 day joint military exercises in August 2020, even midst of COVID. Um, U.S. Uh, forces in Korea, Commander General Robert B. Abrams has renewed the call for the resumption of joint war drills in 2020. Um, so in 2022, Ulti Freedom Guard was revived in five, in five years under the revised name Ulti Freedom Shield. And 2023 alone, according to Chang Changjun, he's a Korea, South Korean researcher, and I heard him speak on the recent June 15 South Korea committee presentation. He said out of 365 days, US ROK or US ROK Japan joint war drills took place 179 days in 2023. He also said that more war drills were under the UN command uh, will take place in 2024. The, these large scale war drills usually take place once in the spring, once in the late summer, so usually March and August. But since Yoon took office, South Korean war drills have increased more than 200 per year on an average. Um, last year in March, um, I brought some pictures from the PSPD people who were uh, demonstrating at the war drill site. So this was March 29th last year and South Koreans in Pohang, uh, it's southeastern of Korea, um, near where the US ROK joint war drills were taking place. Um, you can see the tanks rolling in front of tourists, the protesters. You can see how the military, um, the helicopters flying on this picture, and I'm sure they were making all kinds of noise. Um, so these are some of the pictures. Uh, there was one that people were marching. I, I guess I could get that one. 
Um, so just even just a few few days ago, um, the border residents, uh, the people who live near DMZ, uh, the border area, border towns, they were calling for an end to stop the military action that provoke the war. And um, um, they are afraid that coming March, uh, people like Park sang hak who are uh, so-called North Korea freedom fighters, um, they might fly the propaganda balloons again this spring. And if North Korean army fires against the balloon and the South Korean army can also fire back, what kind of situation? Um, I don't even want to imagine. And there is no hotline that is working. There is no communications channel. Now the September 19th Compre Comprehensive Military Agreement has suspended. How can we guarantee the safety of the border town residents? And how can we guarantee that war, another hot, the Korean war will turn into a hot war? Mm. Yeah, I'm glad you brought up those points because I mean, we've seen this time and time again, escalation is never about safety. And, you know, I, uh, this, it's interesting to think about this idea of like the UN command, which is really, uh, functionally just like it's led by the United States. Um, the former Secretary General of the United Nations, Boutros Boutros Ghali, even distanced himself from the, uh, you know, uh, UN command, quote unquote, uh, in 1994, when he was in office. You talk to me a lot about uh, the UN command and it's, you know, overwhelming ties to just the US military. How much power does the United States have in South Korea? So the UN command, um, so in July 1950, when Korean War started, uh, Unified Command was under the US control of uh, US, US control. So that, that's how the UN command that's led by US was born during the Korean War. Uh, the armistice agreement, in 1953, July 27, that was also signed by UN Command. Um, now, UN Command only exists in its name, and there is no other country that is involved in the UNC currently, other than US. Um, if you watch our documentary, Crossings, um, uh, it's a documentary of our women across the MZ, Christian An, um, organizing other women delegation, making their journey in 2015. They went to North Korea and came, came down to South Korea. So um, during that journey, uh, the delegation had to speak with the U.S. soldiers at, at the DMZ area. And in order to cross into South Korea, they were not speaking to South Korean military. They were talking to U.S. soldiers um, under the name UN Command. Um, one of the crossers at the um, interview later on in that movie said she felt that the U.S. soldiers were in control of this peninsula, not the Koreans. And I agree with her. Um, also, there, there used to be about 100 U.S. bases in South Korea until mid-2000. And they have consolidated uh, since 2000. And now um, it's known that maybe there are 15 U.S. military bases in South Korea. And the U.S. Army base Camp Humphreys in Pyeongtaek is the largest U.S. base outside of United States. It's the largest in the Pacific. So um, USAG Humphreys currently hosts a combined population of approximately 36,500 Department of Defense service members, civilians, contractors and their families. The installation is expected to continue to grow over the next three to five years to roughly 45,000 total personnel. Um, this is according to uh, military sources um, about Camp Pumphrey's uh, USA website, probably US Department of Defense. Um, we often hear uh, about 28,500 US troops in South Korea, but there's a lot more Americans working uh, for the military in South Korea. And Camp Humphreys is supposedly, uh, the size of it is about 3,000 acres. Um, so we can kind of see where Korea is, where US is with Korea. Um, and under the SOFA Status of Forces Agreement, South Korea still does not have the wartime operational control. 
Um, this was discussed during Romian administration that uh, the uh, wartime operation control is often called APCAN. And uh, Romian demanded that APCAN be transferred in 2003 but um, it was uh, never done. It, was, it kept getting delayed. And then um, in 2015, during Lee Myung-bak, it, it got delayed again because he was a conservative president. And then also Moon Jae-in, he uh, wanted to have upcon transfer by 2021, but it still not happened. Um, South Korea is uh, what, like the 10th largest economy during Moon administration. I think it's it's fallen to like 13 right now after Yoon administration. And it's like the sixth largest military power that um in the world. And this is kind of it, South Koreans see this as kind of an insult. Um the US military keeps forcing the US joint war drills as a test to pass the um the question. Uh, to transfer over the upcon. Um, but it is um, it, but it should be that Korea uh, has its own deterrence cap capability against North Korea. Um, and South Korea feels that they do, but North but US is not still not giving up the transferring the upcon. And it's been seven years uh, since mm. uh, the U.S. has 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 command over South Korean military, and um, even after Opcon transfer, uh, because the UN command still has control, um, the South Korean troops can still be part of multinational army under UNC control. So, can South Korea claim that it's a sovereign nation? when their military control is at the hand of another country. So this is still a big issue um, that, so, that South Korea has to overcome on their own. Yeah, I mean, it seems like whether it, it's been, you know, the six party talks, you know, which that was like during the, you know, George W. Bush axis of evil era. Of course, now we have this new kind of uh, push towards like this new axis of evil mentality that I, I heard when I was at a recent hearing featuring uh, Mike Pompeo on the Hill, you know, whether it was that or whether it was the um, Hanoi summit, Hanoi summit being torpedoed uh, by the Trump administration. It seems that the U.S. is always, you know, U.S. interference is always um, there um, kind of in uh, making the peace process stall collapsing it, breaking down talks, and just, you know, causing the process that meets setback after setback. And, you know, how, how does North Korea respond to these setbacks, which happen time and time again? And how do how does, you know, South Korea re react? How do they affect uh, South Korean civil society? Right. So I think that's exactly what we uh, started in the beginning. Uh, why did North Korea change their policy from offensive to defensive mode? Right. Why are they now, uh, you might call it hostile. Why are, have they changed their policies and why have they dropped their reunification um, in their recent in, in their recent policies? Uh, so in in this month in Jan or actually last month already uh, in January I spoke to a few South Korean um, civil society folks, and they're now um, seeing the current situation, uh, some of it as a wake up call and some as an emergency situation. Um, the June fifteen South Korean committee, um, they had their general meetings yesterday, and. I really don't think anybody can blame any of the South Korean activists or, or organizations for, they put up so much effort for the last 70 years, uh, but they could not achieve their certain measurements. Um, but they were saying um, it was not possible to control external interventions and interventions that infringe on sovereignty and peace, such as the trend of strengthening the hostile ROK-US alliance against North Korea, 
which is contradictory to the improvement of inter-Korean relationship and the involvement of the United Nations Command and the ROK US Working Group which have blocked the implementation of the inter-Korean agreement. We must also carefully reflect on the fact that we are not achieving any significant results in dismantling the division and Cold War system. So um, the South Korean organizations are reviewing and they're reflecting on their past, but the reality is that the powers in place have continued to not follow through the past agreements um, South Korean elected conservative regime in the past presidential election. There has not been any change in the South Korean reunification policy that it continues to be reunification by absorption. And I think this current situation should be taken as an opportunity to strengthen the grassroots and civil society groups um, in its heightened threat of war and find more ways to come together nationally and internationally among the Korean, uh, among the Korean people, um, Korean Americans here, Koreans in Europe and Japan, and we should raise our voices louder than ever before to end this war and bring peace. And they are bringing, they are moving very quickly. Um, I think South Korean organizations are very moving very quickly um, and uh, in their meeting, they also said establishing the direction of the movement to eliminate the imperial domination that continues even after liberation and the division and hostile politics subordinated to the US ROK alliance resolve the war crisis and transform the hostile inter-Korean relationship back into a relationship of reconciliation and cooperation. We will brighten the organization's prospects again by rebuilding its capabilities to meet the demand, uh, demands of the new era. And as US uh, Korea peace activists um, and as Korean American myself, um, we will definitely work with the South Korean partners and international uh, partners uh, in solidarity and work with them closer and harder to move the political atmosphere towards peace. Yes, I mean, it's very important, and especially, you know, we're coming off of, you know, last summer when the Biden administration, uh, you know, blocked or, you know, renewed the travel ban that was put in place um, under the last administration. Can you talk a little bit about the travel ban, how it makes the, you know, the fight for peace and just, uh, justice in Korea so much harder. Yes, so Korea Peace Now um, has a campaign. We call it LIFT, L-I-F-T. It's actually an acronym for Let Individuals Freely Travel. And mm -hmm. this is a campaign um, to reinstate the long-standing U.S. policy that allowed U.S. citizens to travel freely to DPRK. Before 2017, Americans were able to travel to North Korea. Um, we could engage in education program, people to people exchanges, families um, that were separated. I know my friend's father deliberately came to the United States so that he can become a US citizen so that he could travel to North Korea to visit his mom, yeah. to, to find yeah. his mom. Mm -hmm. um, because the international, the national security law I mentioned earlier, if you're South Korean, and you, you meet a North Korean, you can be punished, you can be imprisoned for violating mm -hmm. the national security law. Um, so uh, the abrupt halt uh, of this all these travels when, uh, happened when Trump administration ordered a ban on travel to North Korea in 2017. Mm -hmm. So it's very heartbreaking. Um, and um, it's uh, the those separated families are getting older now. Um, and those people who are working on the repatriation, like Rick Downs, um, he works with us and he's a part of repatriation uh, for the US soldiers uh, trying to find the remains of his father and their, mm -hmm. their parents in, in North Korea. Um, and humanitarian workers also have a very difficult time going to North Korea 
to continue their work. Um, so we are continuing to call for ending the travel ban. Uh, we are we from the beginning of the Biden administration, we asked him to reverse the 2017 travel ban and allow U.S. citizens to once again travel freely to North Korea. Yeah, um, thanks for sharing like how you know that's such an important part um, of what needs to of change and. You know, with all these obstacles um, uh, and the U.S. standing in the way of peace, uh, you know, what are your hopes uh, for peace in Korea? And I'd also like to, you know, implore you to, you know, share with folks, how can people best pressure the U.S. to, um, you know, not stand in the way of peace anymore? Thank you. Yes. This is the most important part of today's meeting, right? <laughs> so how can you participate? How can you act? After listening to ECHO for 40 minutes, what can you do uh, to act, to end the Korean War, to participate? Uh, we can educate. You can attend Korea Peace Now grassroots monthly meeting. It's held every second Thursday at 8 p.m. Eastern. We have a study group. Uh, we have in the past the lift uh, and uh, study group co-organizing uh, film screenings, education session. We uh, um, we can bring others to join the education session. Uh, we write op-eds. Our grassroots network members write op-eds. Christine Ahn, Kathy Choi, our Women Cross DMZ staff, they write op-eds. You can join our direct action. Uh, we protest in front of the White House. Um, many of you probably remember, if you were in D.C., that code pink. See the Barbies behind me? <laughs> Medea Benjamin. Um, we can organize protests at, at, on important dates, such as June 15, June 25, when Korean War broke out. July 27th, the uh, armistice, uh, we have a protest coming up, a rally coming up in April in New York for April 27th, um, com commemorating the April 27th joint declaration. And you can join our advocacy week. Uh, we have our annual advocacy week actually coming up uh, in March. So I will drop the link here. Um, we educate our staff of our member of Congress and educate the member of Congress. Uh, we tell them that there is there is a community that is asking for ending the Korean War with the peace agreement. Um, that there is a bill, HR 1369, Peace on the Korean Peninsula Act. Uh, you can ask your elected official to support this bill. Um, I will drop the link um, for this year, uh, our advocacy, Week is kind of early. It's happening from March for March uh, 18th to 22nd. The deadline is March 1st. Um, you can participate in tabling. Uh, you can host crossings film screening. We have Georgetown folks, um, uh, Georgetown students. Um, they are organizing a screening of the crossings documentary. Uh, we do att we attend tabling for fall festivals. Um, in communities in LA, San Francisco, DC area, wherever you have opportunity, New York, uh, whatever, whatever opportunity we have, we let people know that Korean War is still going on. It's been 70 years, it's been 70 years too long that we need to end this longest war that US has been in with North Korea. We can stop the industrial, the US military industrial complex. We can stop the nuclear war threats. We can bring an end to 70 year war with North Korea. The title of the, today's webinar is that North Korea is not our enemy. We can give peace a chance by ending this war with the peace agreement and start normalizing the relationship. The US has fought with many, many countries in the past but we have experience making peace with our adversaries. 70 years is too long. We have to end the Korean War today. 
Oh my, yeah. Thanks so much, Echo. That's so important. And um, yeah, 70 years is too long. We, uh, I think, uh, have a lot um, to understand, a lot to kind of unlearn and relearn. Um, and, you know, it's really important uh, that we also realize that peace is possible and it's necessary. Um, and uh, yeah, I please everyone. I implore uh, uh, everyone in the chat to check out the links that Echo's dropping. And we look. It looks like we have a few questions. Um, uh, Jeffrey Barkdel, uh, if you have a, uh, feel free to un unmute and ask your question. It's not really much. Well, I put a, put a lot of the questions in the chat box, but this is the one. But this is what I really want to say. Say if I to say if i ever just like just like how john city mccain the third worked worked in the 1990s to restore diplomatic relations with vietnam if i became an official federal politician i would work hard to cre create diplomatic relations between the united states and north korea work hard to end the korean war by converting their ceasefire into a peace treaty that's fair equal and where both sides will agree to help the two korea koreas move forward with with reunification and make a plan for how how Korea Korea re, will reunify under one gov government without both firing a shot and shedding a drop of blood that both sides and even their allies will agree to and it and it'll be both fair and equal and as and as a bonus help North Korea create its own world cinema if you if you know what I mean uh yes th thanks Jeffrey um for for sharing that um and Jules, do you, you have a question as well? Uh, yes, can you hear me? Um, yes. Okay, so I just wanted to make a point about um, the U.S. propaganda machine. Um, and thank you very much, Echo. I think you you do like amazing work and thank you, I really applaud you. But um, as you know, uh, like I'm not sure like where everybody's heads at like there's a massive like support for free palestine which i support 100 percent. but we need to also support north korea because there's a silent genocide that's taking place in north korea and it's all because of the u.s propaganda machine that started by george creole cpi uh it, it was a independent like propaganda machine that started that was started by Pres President Woodrow Wilson. And it was to basically persuade reluctant Americans to join the war in Europe back then in 1917, 1920. And basically, you know, to t persuade people to grab them by their emotions, by their unconscious and instinctual urges. You know, this is, it's a propaganda. Why aren't People like they're just so quick to just say judge North Korea and say, oh, look at they have a bomb. They must be guilty. Like, do you so, do your research, please? And also, I wanted to point out that you had a question about who was the USFK commander um, in South Korea. Right. And his name is General Paul Lagamara. He's also the UN command as well as the USFK commander. And he was person that was that blocked the land survey and both North Korea and South Korea wanted to link a railway and he was USFK and UN command blocked that from from you know having a reunification of uh, so I mean and I, I'm not sure if you guys also know that every year I mean this was even, even in New York Times and um just major news outlet that North Korea has been calling for a peace treaty documented since 2010, like every year, but you never hear that in the media, in the US propaganda machine. It's always, you know, about like vil vilifying, like villainizing North Korea. Like, I, so I just do your research, please. Like, you know, uh, people like, come on, like, like you need to support us. If you really want us to really reunite, like you need to support us too, instead of like totally disregarding um, North Korea. Sorry, that's all I wanted to say.
Uh, well, I, I uh, thanks for sharing. I, I think it's so important that we, you know, as at Code Pink, uh, it's there's uh, a big belief in disarming the discourse, um, and you know, fighting back against pro-war propaganda. So that's very important. Um, Sally Jones uh, dropped uh, a question in the chat. Uh, Sally asked, can you recommend resources or books for people who need a primer on the history of North Korea? Um, Sally has been reading the historian Bruce Cummings in particular. Do you have any other recommendations that go? Yes, so there should be a list of, full list of reading, um, recommended reading on our Korea Peace Now website. So I'll drop that in the chat. But one of the articles that I dropped was uh, peoplepower21.org. So this mm -hmm. is a South Korean organization. They publish articles in um, English, in Korean and English too. So this is very good source for news. Um, and I'll drop the some resources page. Um, we also have some reports that we have come up with. We are working on another report on human rights this year. Um, so a lot of things to read on our website, too. Thanks so much, Echo. Uh, I mean, it's really important that I, I feel that we acknowledge uh, what's out there and use it to, uh, you know, as you were saying uh, earlier, kind of use this opportunity, this a lot of this really um, harrowing crisis, this moment of global crisis to actually work for peace, you know, from as Jules was saying, from the genocide in Palestine that's happening right now to uh, the, you know, U.S., um, you know, escalations uh, in Korea, I think it's imperative that we disarm the discourse, that we work for peace, and that we, you know, truly, truly uh, take peace seriously and take, you know, other countries' security co concerns seriously. And uh, Echo, uh, you've uh, prepare such a fabulous presentation. Uh, and so I'd like to thank you so much uh, for joining us today and just in general, being a very dedicated activist for the cause of Korea peace. Um, is there anything that you would like to say um, kind of, you know, before we end? Uh, wait, can I say something first before we, before we do it, before you end, before she gets a chance, I have three questions real quick. Uh, sure. Uh, okay. Yes, you can ask. Yeah. One, uh, number one, um, how can I attend? How can I attend attend to attend those places if I can't if I can't if I literally can't travel? Number two, so who so who is our true enemy? And number three, and this is kind of probably a funny one. Do you who wishes that Kim Jong Un be on was on the Zoom meeting? <laughs> okay. So the advocacy meetings are online, actually. So you can attend from your work, from your home, uh, with the computer or your phone. So that's very easy. So who is our true enemy? I think the military industrial complex is our true enemy. The people who are greedy, who are selling weapons and putting manufacturing, keeping the war for profit is our enemy. Um, and the last question was if Kim Jong-un was on this call, um, yeah, I guess if there was a way for us to directly speak with North Koreans and hear about their policies and um, ask them what we can do and how we can cooperate. Yes. <laughs> I, I think, you know, I, I, I'm reminded of the fact I, I lived in Beijing for, for a number of years. I remember I, I, you know, visited one of the North Korean restaurants that were there. I remember talking to some of the North Korean workers there and it was the first time I I ever met someone from North Korea. And that moment, you know, it was crazy that I had to go to another country to meet someone from North Korea. And, you know, I think that's why people to people diplomacy is so important in that we all from country to country have more chances to engage with each other and truly realize that, you know, no people, uh, no other people are, are our enemies. Um, and indeed, you know, we need to all cooperate together for another world. So um, yes, I'd like to say thanks so much, Echo. Uh, you've been uh, great to just share this really critical insight on the escalation happening in Korea. And um, uh, thanks everyone for joining as well.
Thank you so much. I found the link to our books and films recommendation just now. Awesome. Yeah, check that out.